Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we begin a new book of the Bible, and it's a big one, but it's a good one. They're all good, but uh, many, many people especially like the book of Psalms, and that's where we begin today. The book of Psalms, chapter 1, verse 1. So get your Bible and uh, so that you can follow along with me, and I hope you can stick with me through this entire study. And we'll begin in just a minute. Just want to remind you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website where you can study the book of Psalms, the previous versions or previous series going through the Bible, and any other book of the Bible, three complete series going through the Bible at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click and listen. Click the book, click the chapter, open your Bible, follow along, and listen as I teach it verse by verse. That's at the Bible, versebyverse.com. Well, Psalm chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> and the Bible says... <coughs> Excuse me. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Blessed is the man who doesn't do any of those things. Blessed means happy. If you want to be happy as a Christian, then God says what you need to do is make a clean break from sin. You will never be happy as a Christian. You will never have peace as a Christian. You will never have the joy of the Lord as a Christian unless you make a clean break break with sin and he explains here don't listen to what ungodly people tell you to do and don't try to be like them the church makes a huge mistake when it tries to be like the world that's not what we're called to do you can be accepted by the world if you're enough like them but you won't have the joy of the Lord. You won't have the power of God in your life. You'll never be happy as long as you're compromising with the world. So he says, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. The best way to avoid the misery that comes from being corrupted by the influence of the ungodly is to take in the Word of God regularly. Meditate upon it day and night. Any chance you get, open up the Bible, read a verse, read a chapter, read as much as you can. Study it just as much as you can. Make the Word of God your priority and you will avoid the you will avoid being corrupted by the influence of the ungodly notice verse 3 and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season its leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper the benefits of being in god's word are many and they are spiritual. But the benefits of being in God's word may not show up immediately. They will be there in their season, according to verse 3. In other words, at the right time. You will be what God wants you to be when he wants you to be it. Stay in the word of God. And that's 
in big measure why you will have peace. Because the more you're in the Word of God, the less you're corrupted by the deceitfulness of sin and the influence of the world, the less interest you will have in the things of the world and the sinfulness of the world. And you will know, you will have a conviction from spending time with God that you are where God wants you to be and doing what you want or what he wants you to do in his time, in his place. And there's peace knowing that he's in control. And knowing he's in control is a byproduct of spending time in the Word because that's how you draw close to him. For the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. The ungodly may seem to have it pretty good, and they might, but it's only for a season. They have it good oftentimes because they're going along with the flow of the world. But it's going to pass away. Whatever success, whatever happiness they have is going to pass away. It will quickly vanish. All happiness will come to a screeching, permanent loss for those who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Verse 5. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. A very sober warning from Almighty God. The ungodly will not make it through Judgment Day in one piece. The soul of a lost sinner, the soul of an unsaved person, hear me, is a vile thing to God. Vile, putrid, disgusting. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. An unsaved person is vile to God because we have no idea just how putrid our sins are to our Creator, how much He hates them, how much He despises sin. And so he will not allow them to be in the congregation of the righteous. He will not allow the ungodly who refuse to have their sins removed through Jesus Christ to stand in the congregation of the righteous, to be in his presence in heaven, to be on the new earth after everyone is raised from the dead, he will not tolerate them. Everybody talks about tolerance today. Well, you know, as far as, as far as do you have the right to live any way you want to live and suffer the consequences as a result? Yeah, sure, you have the right. I tolerate anyone's right to live the way they want to live if that's what they choose to do. But it doesn't mean that I like it. And it doesn't mean I have to be around it. And God tolerates it too. But only for a season. Because their evil will run its course and it will catch up to them. And anyone who sins against God and persists to the end in rejecting God's forgiveness through His Son, Jesus Christ, should not be shocked when they end up in hell forever and ever. Verse 6. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. God delights in godly people. They shall be rewarded. But the wicked, along with all of their ungodly ways, will come to nothing. 
they shall perish. And when God says they shall perish, he's not talking about becoming extinct, going out of existence. They will suffer eternal death, which means eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. They will be in a place where nobody cares about them, where nobody thinks about them, a place of torment, a place where there is no hope, a place where there is not one second of relief from horrible pain, eternal doom, eternal damnation, eternal suffering because they have sinned against a holy God. They will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. According to God, his soul abhors them. Chapter 2. Why do the nations rage? Why do the heathen rage? And the peoples imagine a vain thing. Why do you, God asks the question, why do you ungodly people waste your time opposing God and his ways? Why do you do that? You are wasting your time. You are doing a useless thing. It is a vain thing. Why do the nations rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? Those who think that they can go through life sinning against God and get away with it are imagining a vain thing. Their thoughts are useless. They are warped. They are wrong. There's not a chance. Those who think that they can go through their, this life, be a God to themselves, scoff at the fact that there is a creator God who is also judge, who also became a man and died on the cross to be the only Savior from sin. Those who scoff at that and think that they can do things their way and they're so sophisticated and they're so smart are imagining a vain thing. You couldn't be any more foolish than what you are, according to God. You are wasting your time, and you are in for a rude awakening. And that's why God says, why? Why do you do it? Why are you doing that? You have God's word right here. He's trying to warn you. Why do the nations, why do the heathen rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? Verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, who would be his son, Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the son of God. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, the anointed again, refers to Jesus Christ. All who oppose Christ, all who oppose the message of Christ, all who oppose the written word of Almighty God concerning Jesus Christ will end up ruined. All the power that the world can muster all the power that the devil can muster. Satan and all of his devils, the world and all of its military might, the world and all of its intelligentsia will not be able to help those who reject Jesus Christ on the day of reckoning. Verse 3, this is what they say. This is their attitude. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. We don't need to be governed by God. We need to be free. Let's be free to do what we want to do. The impenitents say, we want to be free from God. 
We will not let Jesus, God's anointed, rule over us. We will not tell, we will not let Jesus, the Son of Almighty God, God's anointed, to tell us how to live. Like Pharaoh, king of Egypt, back in the book of Exodus, they say, I do not know the Lord, and I will not obey him. And you know what that is? That is, that is the empty boast of Christ rejectors who defy God and his son. That's all it is. Because notice verse 4. After listening to all this boasting of all these people who reject God and reject Christ and reject the word of God, after listening to all that, verse 4 says, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. God listens to that. Almighty God. You're talking about Almighty God. You're talking about God, the creator of all things. God, who knows everything about everyone before they're even born. God, who knows the end from the beginning. God, know, God who knows everything that you are going to say before those words of yours even leave your lips. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. And then it goes on to say, the Lord shall have them in derision. Puny, insignificant, impenitent, sinful, human trash. God laughs at your boasting. God laughs at your smart talk. God could have you in the flames of hell before you got your next blasphemous word out. God could throw you into the lake of fire before you could show your next sneer at the word of God. He could throw you into hell before you took your next breath if he chose to. That's how powerful God is. And make no mistake, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Jesus said, if you do not believe in me, you will die in your sins. And the wages of sin is eternal death in the lake of fire. So sneer if you want to. Reject the word of God if you want to. Scoff at the word of God that is so crystal clear. And God's offer of forgiveness and mercy through Jesus Christ and his warnings for those who pers persist in sin. Scoff at it all if you want to. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. God will have you in derision. Five. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his great displeasure. God will terrify the ungodly. God will terrify the scoffers, the mockers. It is not a question of if. It is only a question of when. God is patient. Which, which is why he hasn't done it to you yet. He is patient. But he is not patient forever. On that day, 
when his patience has run off, when his patience has run out, and you stand before him, you will be terrified. And you will not talk big on that day, and you will not smirk anymore at the word of God, and no one's going to think you're so sophisticated. You're going to cringe before the Almighty. The Almighty that you have offended more than you can possibly imagine. And you are going to be terrified. Verse 6. Let's read 5 along with it. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his great displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. God says to the wicked, there is a king. He is my son. He is my king. And he will stop out evil. And that includes you. Nothing will stop him from doing it. You can, you can scoff, you can mock, you can boast. But God says, I'm going to laugh at it all. And then he says, yet, in spite of all that, I will set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Judgment day is coming. And you are going to feel the full force of God's wrath. Unless you repent. Verse 7. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Begotten does not mean created. Jesus was not created. Oh, his human nature was. But the eternal son is the eternal son of the eternal father. So begotten does not mean created. It's talking about the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And that fantastic miracle, that greatest of all miracles, Jesus did so many miracles that the Apostle John, in writing his gospel, said there wouldn't be enough paper in the world to record all of them. But that, that greatest of all miracle, to raise Jesus from the dead three days after he was crucified, as he said he would come back, was the Father's way of declaring that his son Jesus was indeed his son, that his son Jesus paid for the sins of man with his death on the cross for all who would come to him in repentance, and when the Father raised Jesus from the dead, he was declaring that Jesus was his eternal son with power. Verse 7, verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possessions. As a rule, a king inherits his kingdom from his father. Well, when Jesus Christ returns, which he says he will, God the Father will give his son Jesus the entire world to rule over. He will inherit the kingdom of all creation from his father, and he will rule forever and ever. So if you're waiting for somebody else someone more sympathetic to your rebellious ways to take charge, you're going to have a long wait. It's going to be really long. You're going to be waiting forever in the lake of fire, and it's not going to happen. Verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This is talking about judgment day. First order of business, for a new king 
back in Old Testament days, and maybe after that, usually the first order of business for a new king was to get rid of all opposition to his rule. All rivals to his throne were eliminated. That's generally how it always worked. And that's what Christ is going to do. He will not allow his utopian society. He will not allow the new earth that he will create along with the new heavens when he returns and sets up his kingdom. He will not allow his new society, his new earth to be ruined, to be corrupted by impenitent sinners. They will be eliminated. Verse 10, be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. In other words, God says, use your heads. Learn your lesson before it's too late, because what I am telling you is going to happen. It's reality, and you won't be able to run from it. You can ignore it. You can pretend it's not true. You can hope it's not true. But the truth will catch up to you. This is sealed. This is etched in eternal stone by the word of God. And God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. So what should you do? God tells you in verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Serve God with fear. You know what the word fear means? It means fear. How's that for a revelation? It means be afraid. And rejoice in how good the Lord is. Serve the Lord with fear. He's not one of the boys upstairs. But also rejoice in how good the Lord is. Enjoy him. And I can tell you, there's a huge difference between a lost sinner on the way to hell who doesn't know God, who isn't a part of the family of God. They ought to be afraid because they're a heartbeat, a heartbeat out of hell. There's a huge difference between them and Christians who enjoy God. They love God because they know how much he loves them. There's a relationship with your creator that is the best thing in all of the world. So serve God with fear knowing that God is God, but enjoy him too. He's good to be around. God's not only an easy God to love because he's so loving toward us, but he's an easy God to like. He's a likable God. He's fun to be around. I'm not talking about becoming overly familiar with him. And forgetting that he's almighty God, just saying. There's that aspect of a relationship with God. Verse 12, kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled by the little. Blessed are all they who put their trust in him. There is no refuge from the wrath of almighty God outside of his son, Jesus Christ. God is holy. God, God is holy and his holy anger is going to explode. God is saying, welcome Jesus Christ into your life as Lord and Savior. So that his holy justice and his holy anger does not consume you in the lake of fire. Out of time. Continue studying the word of God at thebibleversebyverse.com. Click the book you want to study, click the chapter, open your Bible, listen, follow along, and teach as I teach it verse by verse. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please remember, we're brought to you by your prayers and financial support. If you want to be a part of this ministry and help me get out the Word of God, you can. Click the Donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give us the Lord may lead. And please pray for this ministry. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.